Okay, we're in the middle of looking at uh, First Peter. I always like to back up and kind of go through a little bit so we can pick back up with where we are, because as I say many times, what we're doing, we're in one sense reading somebody else's mail. Don't panic. Of course, we're, you know, the scripture is written to us, but is written to us through initially being written to these Christians in Asia Minor. So we have to see, we have to track what is being said. And so that's what I try to do. And that's why I keep going back and letting you, reminding you of the flow of thought, at least as I understand it, where we are. Because you can't just parachute into letters as though other things haven't been said and going on and just pull out lines and words. It's a prescription for disaster to do that. So that's what we're trying to do here. Now, we're in the, we're in the middle of this section of, of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 through 4, 6. I at least uh, see that on. I get it. I see that as a section. And here's I've broken this into three slides, 313 to 4, 6. And in 313 to 17, in verses 13 and 14, Peter tells them that men cannot harm faithful Christians in any ultimate sense. And we've talked about that. And in light of that, he commands them not to fear the threats or intimidations of their opponents. So here they are. They're being pressured. They're getting the hammer in some way, shape or form. They're being threatened, socially ostracized, maybe being take, taken to court on trumped up charges. It is difficult being a Christian here in Asia Minor. He says you're not to fear their threats and intimidations. You're not you're not to, to let that cow you into not being the person that you are called to be. Instead of doing that, you are to reaffirm your commitment to Jesus Christ. You're to set him apart in your heart as Lord. You are to renew and confirm as you're being pushed and bullied. You say no, like a mad dog. I'm hanging on to Jesus. I'm hanging on to him, despite what the culture is doing and all that. Now, related to that, he tells them in verse 15 that they're always to be ready to give a defense to anyone who demands an accounting for the hope that is in or among them. And then in verse 16, he says, when they do that, they're to do it with gentleness. They're not to be arrogant, nasty, mean, any of that stuff. But they're always to be ready to give this uh, to give a defense for the hope that is in them. Then in verse 17, He reinforces the call to keep their conduct good, the call to live with a clear conscience before God. They're to do so because or for it's better to suffer for doing good, which God sometimes wills. He sometimes permits. It's better to suffer for doing good than to suffer for doing evil. And then in verse 18 of chapter three, he explains that it's better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil, because in the former case, one is following the path of Christ. Christ suffered for doing good. He suffered for faithfulness. He suffered for the call of God that he would, he says, that that he suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. That was God's purpose for his life. So if you are suffering for doing good, you are doing so, you're following the path of Christ. So he gives the reason for that. Then in the second part of verse 18 through verse 20, this is what we spent most of last week on. I'm just going to give you the bottom line here. I believe Peter's saying that the spirit, the Holy Spirit, by whom Christ was raised from the dead, is the same spirit through whom Christ went and preached in the person of Noah to the people who disobeyed when Noah was building the ark, people who have since died, they were killed in the flood, and since that time their spirits have been imprisoned in Hades awaiting the final judgment in the realm of the dead. Now, I went through all that, tried to explain why I think that's the, the better view. Noted to you it's a notoriously difficult section of Scripture. Pointed out to you that what I'm offering to you is, is today considered a, it's a minority view today. With all those caveats, I still think it's the, it's the better view of that text. Try to explain why I think that. Now, I think these remarks that he makes in 3.18 to 20, that they serve to remind Peter's readers that Christ is through the Spirit working in them and with them. He's working with them toward the goal of appealing as a small minority to an ungodly and hostile world, just as you had Noah. So especially through extra biblical writings where we see that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, appealing to people, and he was being mocked. And you see Peter adopting that understanding when he says he describes Noah in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5, as a preacher of righteousness. So we have this, we have, I think he's telling them all this because he's encouraging them that, that as Christ is working through Noah 
in his appeal to the people of that day. He is working through you in your appeal to the people of your day. And he wants them to know that as in the days of Noah, God was waiting patiently for those people to repent. He is waiting patiently for the people of their day to repent. He is waiting patiently for the people of our day to repent. And he also wants them to know that whenever he chooses to bring the flood of judgment, that the faithful people like Noah and his family, they will pass safely through that. We need to know that. You see, the flood of judgment is coming whenever God chooses to bring it. So that's why I think he went into that. He says in 321 that the water of the flood, which served as the means of Noah's deliverance, as well as the means of the world's judgment... He says that that water of that flood, it foreshadows or symbolizes the water of baptism through which they were saved, that now saves them. And that is why and I, I made the point. See, baptism saves us because Christ's atoning work. It is the point in which we express our faith. It is the culminating expression of our faith so that we then personally appropriate the atoning death of Jesus Christ. And so baptism saves us in that sense. It doesn't save us in that there's something mechanical or magic in the water. It saves us because it is God's ordained way of expressing our faith so that we then appropriate personally the atoning death of Jesus Christ. OK, and there are many passages that talk about that. And I've spent, uh, you know, single classes just talking about that. Now, I wanted to say something about chapter three, verse 22. I read chapter four, one to six before we ended and I didn't say anything about 322, and I want to just say something about that, then we'll move, move on into chapter 4. In 322, up at the end of 321, he says, Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who having gone into heaven is at the right hand of God, with angels and authorities and powers being subject to them. And he reminds them in verse 22 of the supreme position and authority of the one to whom they are loyal, the one for whom they're suffering. Well, that's good to know. I mean, here they are getting the hammer. They're getting pressured. They're facing difficulties because of their commitment to Jesus Christ. Well, it's good to know that he is the one who is at the right hand of God, the father, and that all hostile spiritual powers are subject to him. OK, all those spiritual powers, all hostile spiritual powers, all powers anywhere are subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the implication is, is that there's nothing ultimately to fear from the attacks of those powers that are expressed through human persecutors. Now, how does that work? What is the mechanics of that? I don't know, but you see there's a spiritual war going on. And when people are attacking Christians, they are manifesting or reflecting the desires of spirits that are opposed to this, opposed to us. So he wants them to know, listen, you have nothing to fear from those powers, the hostilities expressed through the people who are persecuting you. See, they're on the side of them. <clears throat> you know, we can't stand this. You're an enemy of the society. You're worthless. This is horrible. You're evil. Get rid of them. Which ultimately will, you know, this will culminate in, in the slaughter of Christians. You know, it starts with Nero's persecution where we have, you know, the, the Roman Empire there. And then we have persecutions for centuries. Breaking out where people are being killed. And some, I've read some of that to you before and I'll do it again sometime. But it's just important to know, you see, that... that the implication, they have nothing to fear from these attacks because these spiritual beings can only do what the Lord permits them to do. They are not rival powers. It is not, you know, you don't get this dualism where we have the Lord here and then we have rival comparable powers duking it out. They are subjects of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, they are subjects. He is Lord of all. So he wants them to know, listen, I know you're getting the hammer, but you need to understand that the powers that are animating this, they are subjects of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, to me, is a comforting thing, and it certainly was comforting to the people in the first century. All right, chapter 4. This is where we left off. He says in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, you also must arm yourselves with the same resolve. For he who suffered in the flesh has finished or broken with sin. So as to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For enough time has passed to have participated in the desire of the Gentiles, having traveled in licentiousness, lust, instances of drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and detestable acts of idolatry, regarding which they are surprised by your not running with them into the same flood of debauchery, vilifying you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. 
For to this end, the gospel also was preached to the dead, that they may be judged in the flesh according to men, but live by the spirit according to God. See, since Christ, their master, our master, since he suffered for faithfulness to God, did he not? What did he endure for faithfulness? God has called him to atone for the sins of mankind, and he suffered for faithfulness to God horribly. And since Christ suffered in the flesh, he suffered for faithfulness, they must arm themselves with the same resolve, the same determination, the same commitment to suffer for faithfulness. They have to be bound to that. We're ready to do that. We're committed to do that. We're determined to do that. We have resolved in our hearts that we will suffer for faithfulness rather than be unfaithful. Now, you think about that. You know, when I think about, you know, sometimes I wonder if the church, see, a church in times of persecution, when it's called to this kind of thing, you don't have people around who aren't serious. You see, but when the good times roll, you have many, many people. And I just say that because many, many churches, it's so difficult to get people. You talk about suffer. You can't get them to do anything. Right. I mean, you, you can't get them to participate. You can't get them to serve. You have to sign up for this. You can't. And I'm thinking, will we suffer? Will we suffer for Christ if we won't serve? You know, it just seems like, what are you, crazy? Or I can't uh, help me on this story. But one time John was out. I think John and a friend Clayton Hartline, they were, that's the Church of Christ name, isn't it? Clayton Hartline? Yeah. He, he, and, he and John, they were out uh, knocking on doors and talking to uh, somebody. And, and, and maybe it was just Clayton, but the guy said, they were asking about, would you die for Jesus? And the guy said, essentially, are you crazy? You know, you start talking like that, and people say, well, this, you know, this guy, this is fanatic. This is fanatic stuff here. Okay, but he's here. Peter is telling the Spirit of God is speaking to us today. And he says, therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, you must arm yourselves with the same resolve. You see that it requires resolve to endure suffering for faithfulness. It's evident from the declaration that he makes here when he says, you must arm yourselves with the same. For he who suffered in the flesh has broken with sin. Has finished with sin. In other words, no one suffers for faithfulness who has not finished with sin, who has not broken with sin, who has not resolved to endure suffering rather than to avoid it by being unfaithful. You have to be committed to that. You have to resolve. You say, I'm going to hold to Christ. I'm going to be pressured. They're going to come after me. What? Look at our society. What's going to, What's happening? Straws in the wind. Okay, an enemy of the state, a bigot, somebody who's bad for harmony. You Christians are all alike. You know, will they take your money? Will they sue you for different things? Will they throw you in jail? What do you do? You have to arm yourselves with the same resolve. You say, I am going to be faithful to Christ, whatever happens. Whatever happens. They're not going to get me to say, no, deny him, be unfaithful to him. I'm not going to do it. Okay, well, this is a this is a command. You have to arm yourselves with that resolve, with that commitment, that determination. Choose. You got to choose. And so he's telling them that arm yourselves that way and see the nature or consequence of this resolve. You see, it's it's. Laid out in verse two, the nature of consequence is that one who has it. How does that person live who has has that resolve, who's made that commitment? I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be faithful. I don't care what happens. How does that shake out? The way it shakes out is that one lives one's remaining life no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. OK, you see, this is what the church is. This isn't just for preachers, teachers. This is Christianity. This is everybody that we are to commit our lives. We are resolved to endure whatever because we are in love with Jesus Christ and we will not deny him. Whatever people say, whatever, however they paint us and portray us and all that, we will speak on his behalf. We will not deny him. We will not be unfaithful to him. That's what he's calling him to do. 
He says they should they should arm themselves with this commitment to the will of God for the additional reason that before their conversion, they'd already spent enough time in the Gentile wasteland of sinful living. You remember, they're, they're converted Gentiles. So he says, listen, you need to arm yourselves with this commitment to the will of God because you've already spent enough time in this wasteland of sinful living, which was replete with rampant sexual sin, intoxication and detestable idolatry. And the sexual sin and the intoxication may well have been coupled with the idolatry. That's how it went. Okay, we're not we didn't invent sexual sin. You know, we think we're cool. Those powers have been around as long as mankind and mankind has been finding a way to vent them against the will of God. And so we had the Gentile world that didn't know God, didn't care about God, had walked away from God. And he says, look, you lived enough time that way, you know, living in that way, in that wasteland of sinful living. So, you you know, there's an additional reason for going ahead and, and Arming yourselves with this commitment to the will of God and regarding their repentance from this sinful lifestyle, their acquaintances, their buddies, they were all surprised that they no longer joined with them in sinning. And what do they do? They heap scorn on them. OK, I used to do that to people. I mean, you know, I remember when I was at the University of Florida, I'm out here and if I gators, by the way. That's right. Gators. You know, I, I just humiliate people who wouldn't go out and get drunk. I mean, it'd just be crazy. I'd just be going around and just, you know, uh, just try. And so this is how it is. Scorn. They heap scorn on you. So why? Because you won't participate in that stuff. It's not like they say, okay, well, that's okay. You know, you don't want to do it. No. They're strong arming you into doing it. You know, they want you to do that. And I'm telling you, they're animated by powers that are opposed to God. There's a war going on. If you don't see the war, if you walk around thinking that, you know, it's all about uh, naturalism and there isn't a spiritual war and all that, you're missing it. There's a war going on. And so this idea of heaping scorn on them is simply to pressure them to engage in this kind of conduct. They heap that scorn on them. But Peter reminds them that those heaping the scorn, they're going to face divine judgment. Another topic. Can we talk about divine judgment? You know, you say, well, you know, our, our society, we don't like hearing about that. Well, yeah, what are we going to do? We're just going to redline this stuff in the Bible? Well, yeah, you know, that really won't play very well here in Mesa. <sighs> are we going to preach the Bible? Okay, so what's he telling me? He sits here and he says that these people are hooping, heaping scorn on you. He tells them that they'll face divine judgment. They will account for their rebellion to the one who's ready to judge the living and the dead. A judgment is coming. This life isn't all there is. This, this life you live here and now, you know, you were given this existence. You came into existence. And this life that you live here and now isn't the be all and end all. There is a judgment coming. And I remember again, when John was sharing the gospel with me, I was telling him, you know, I said, oh, you know, this stuff is just a cop out for basically, in so many words, basically for weak people who are afraid of dying. And John's idea, he would tell me in so many words is, he said, well, look, you know, what would you rather do? Think that when you die, you just become worm, worm food? You just go out of existence? Or, do you, or to think that when you die, you will stand before God and give an account for the life that you've lived? He said, now, which is the cop-out? Mm, yeah, okay, that's, that's good. <laughs> you see? And so this idea, there's a judgment that is coming, as uh, David says in his commentary, even the dead cannot escape the final judgment. You see, this idea of judging the living and the dead normally refers to Christ's judgment. Now, verse six, this is one of these notoriously difficult verses. OK, you can see why he says, for to this end, the gospel also was preached to the dead, that they may be judged in the flesh according to men, but live by the spirit according to God. Now, given that the final judgment encompasses the dead. OK, what he's just said in verse five, I think Peter reminds them of why the gospel had been preached to their to, to, Preach to those of their number who were now dead, those who believed in Christ, who came to faith and have since passed on, have since died. OK, why was the gospel preached to those who've already passed on? It had also been preached to them, preached to them as well as to those who are still living because it protects against God's judgment even beyond the grave. His judgment of the dead. He speaks of the judgment of the living and the dead. Death does not free one from the judgment of God. 
It is not like here. Okay, I'm here. Jesus didn't return. The judgment didn't happen. I die and that's it. No. You see, he is coming to judge what? The living and the dead. You see? So he's letting them know, listen, that this gospel was preached to those who are now dead, to these deceased saints, so that though they were judged negatively while in the flesh, while living in this world, they were judged negatively in the flesh according to the will or standards of men. How did people perceive them? How did people treat them? They persecuted them. They were judged negatively. They were seen as fools. They were jumped on, persecuted, squeezed, pushed, harassed. They were judged negatively while here in the flesh according to the will or purpose of men. That's how it went. You see, they were persecuted for their faith during their earthly lives. But his point is, is that death did not mean they were fools for having endured that suffering. Do you see, here's somebody who's bearing all this suffering, this persecution, this being pushed, all of this stuff. And then he winds up dying and saying, this guy's a chump. He endured all of that. And then just like everybody else, he died. The great equalizer, he died. So he should have been eating, drinking and being merry because he just died. He was a fool for having endured What people heaped on him because he was a Christian. Okay, so he's telling him, look, death is not the final word. They were not fools for having endured that suffering. The gospel was preached to them so that however they suffered at the hands of men, they will, despite having died, be given life by the spirit according to the will or standards of God. How were they treated in this world by men? By men, they were abused. They were judged negatively. They were persecuted. Death, they've died now. Were they foolish for that? No, they were not. Because this judgment of the living and the dead, they are going to be spared from that judgment. They will be given resurrection life by the Spirit according to the will or the purpose of God. Okay, that's what I think he's talking about. Let me read to you the comments of two commentators. Here's Paul Actemeyer. He says, the point of verse 6 is thus not to provide justification for God's right to judge both living and dead. Nor is it to give further light on the obscure event described in 319. The point rather is the encouragement of embattled Christians to assure them that their faith, despite their rejection by human beings and death and the death that has overtaken some of their fellow believers, has not been in vain. Rather, the same judgment that will require an account from those who have blasphemously opposed the Christians, verse 5a, will also see the vindication of those Christians who had undergone what appeared to their unbelieving, their non-believing contemporaries to be the judgment of death and hence the demise of all their hopes. You see, they're looking at people who are dead and say, you know, you guys, you're out here living. You're just like we are. No difference. They're dead. And he's saying there is a judgment coming of the living and the dead and embracing the gospel protects one from that judgment. They will be given resurrection life. Here's how Thomas Schreiner puts it. He says, Peter considered the case of believers who had died physically. These people heard and believed the gospel when they were alive, but had subsequently died. Unbelievers viewed the death of believers as proof that there's no advantage in becoming a believer for all without exception die. Peter indicated, however, that unbelievers do not understand the whole picture. Even though from a human perspective, believers seem to gain no benefit from their faith since they die after having suffered persecution during their life by the will or standard of people who judge them inadequate, judge them wrong. So they were chumps. According to the world's view, he says, even though from a human perspective, believers seem to gain no benefit from their faith since they die from God's perspective, which is normative. They live according to the spirit. Death is not the last word for believers. They will be raised from the dead. The contrast between flesh and spirit here is parallel to three. First Peter three eighteen. Last week, I went through that. How I see that it parallels here. OK, in there in the flesh by the spirit. OK, I'm with Schreiner on this. He says the contrast between flesh and spirit here is parallel to first Peter three eighteen. for Christ died in terms of his flesh. But he was raised to life by the Holy Spirit. A similar destiny awaits believers. They die physically, but will be raised to life by the Holy Spirit. 
I'm suggesting, therefore, that Peter did not consider the intermediate state here, but the resurrection of the dead. He used the present tense because the future will certainly come to pass. This interpretation makes the best sense contextually, for it gives the readers encouragement to continue to endure the social ostracism they're facing from their contemporaries. Peter reminded his readers that even if they die physically, death is not the last word. The resurrection awaits them. You see, I talk about this a lot because, as many people have said, eschatology and the resurrection is the heart of New Testament theology. You see, and we, sometimes you say, well, that's too other there. That's too, you know, far off and all that kind of stuff. I'm telling you, we have to understand that there is a resurrection coming. There is a new creation, a new heaven, new earth. And we're going to live there in a perfect reality. And that should animate all that we do. And we should be, because of that goal of God, doing what we can to live in conformity with that. In the here and now, in the overlap of the ages. And so it's just, I think it's just a very important thing for us to understand. Now, modern commentators, you know, if you think, well, this is, seems kind of, kind of off, just to point out to you, vast majority of modern commentators understand this verse to mean that the gospel was preached to those who were now dead, dead at the time of the letter, though they were alive on earth when it was preached to them. I've got ten of them written here. Uh, I'm not going to name them all for you. But if this is just, an, in fact, you have three translations, the NIV, TNIV, and New English translation that insert the word now there so you won't miss this understanding. So we, down here it says, for to this end, the gospel was preached to the now dead. Okay, those who have since died after converting. And then he's telling them that for the reasons that I tried to explain. All right, let me go to fourth chapter four of seven to eleven here. He says, the end of all things has drawn near. Therefore, be clear thinking and self-controlled for prayers. Above all, have earnest love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the diverse grace of God. If anyone speaks, do it as speaking words of God. If anyone ministers, do it as, as from the strength God supplies so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom is the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, the end of all things has drawn near. See, with the Christ event, with the incarnation, the ministry, the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, the end has drawn near in that the necessary grounds or basis for the final eternal state has occurred. He and his work, his achievement, that is the grounds or the basis for the final eternal state. The victory has been won by Christ. You see, his atoning death, it purchased not only our redemption, but the redemption of creation. All things that are reconciled to God are reconciled to him because of Christ's atoning death. He is the means of universal reconciliation. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 to 10, God's will for the handling of the end of history is to unify heaven and earth in Christ. You see, in other words, his will is to heavenize creation. His will is to redeem creation, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8. He has not been defeated. He has not said, okay, here's this creation, this good, perfect creation, that sin has come in. Okay, you won that round. No, you didn't win that round. I'm redeeming creation. I am redeeming creation. It will be transformed. It will have the ultimate makeover. It will be the new heavens and new earth. The home where resurrection life will be experienced, where it will be lived out. See, he's going to heavenize this creation from the time of Christ's redemptive work. The final state has been, as we might say, a done deal. From the time of his redemptive work, the final state has been a done deal. All that remains is for the consequence of Christ's achievement to play out. The victory has been won. The basis, the grounds for the eternal state has happened in history. And we just wait for it. If if we just wait for that achievement to play out. Now, Christ's work, you say, well, why was his work essential for the victory? 
It's essential for the victory because the redemption of creation, all of that, the only means by which God forgives sin consistently with his holiness and his righteousness is the cross of Christ. That is the only way he forgives consistently with that. Otherwise, if he just forgives, you say, okay, well, he's winking at sin. He's not taking sin seriously. Well, then, okay, well, then what's his other choice? Is it to crush us and destroy us? You say, no. What has he done? He has offered himself. He has offered himself so that it is in that atoning act that God can forgive consistently. He, it is the means of holy forgiveness, the means of righteous forgiveness. And so Christ is this means of reconciling all of creation because we are part of creation. We are the crucial part of creation. So all will be brought into harmony with God. All will be recognized. We will live forever in resurrection bodies. Now, this work is essential for that. See, when the, when the victory that, that has already been won by Christ, now when that victory will be cashed out, so to speak, when it will be finally expressed, when God will send the Christ to consummate the kingdom that Christ inaugurated with his first coming, when will he finalize things? When will he bring history as we know it to, to an end? When will he begin the final eternal state? Okay, that is a matter of God's unknown timing. You see, when he will do that, when this will be cashed out, when it will be fully expressed, the victory that Christ has won, that is a matter of God's unknown timing. As Jesus says in Mark 13, 32, Matthew 24, 36, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son. That'll make you scratch your head. Nor the Son. But apparently the Son has chosen that he won't know this. Nor the Son, but only the Father. See, Peter specifically cautions his readers in 2 Peter chapter 3. Lord willing, we'll get there in a few months. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, he specifically cautions his readers not to allow the apparent slowness of Christ's return to become a cause for doubting the certainty of it. You had people there. You had false teachers there saying, where is this coming, dude? I see a lot of this. I'm not seeing any coming. Everything goes on just the way it did. You're full of baloney. Okay? You're talking about a coming, but I'm not seeing anything. Well, Peter tells them right there, he tells them that God operates in his own dimension of time. Does that shock anyone? That's stupid. That can't be. What are you talking about? You mean it can't be that the one who spoke this creation into existence, he can't operate on another dimension of time? Well, that's what Peter's telling them. He says, God has his own dimension of time with the Lord. One day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So he cannot be judged by human perceptions of slowness. That's his point in Second Peter. So we sit and go, you know, you believe part of that. See, I think is it saps from the church, the anticipation, the trust that Christ is coming. Well, you say, oh, you know, it's been a long time. I really don't think, you know, after 2000 years, you're really not going to come Well, what does that do to people? It defeats them spiritually. It drains them. You see, we have to look to that. We have to know that that's happening. Now, since Christ's achievement, I'm going to try to get this across to you. Okay, let me elaborate on this a bit. Since Christ's achievement, creation has been on the verge of the end. Now, here's a diagram from a 19th century preacher, a guy named J.H. Newman. Poorly drawn diagram because I drew it and I draw like this. All right, but it's cited in uh, three modern commentaries on 1 John. And you see how it says history before Christ as proceeding toward the end. And then history after Christ, you see, is passing along and going along in parallel to the end. Right on the edge of the end. You see, and as long as this reality, history as we know it, continues, it does so on the brink of Christ's return and the consummation of all things. It can arc over any time. You see, we are on the brink of the consummation. However long God in his purposes extends the time since Christ, Christ's coming is ever at the door. You see, it's, it's always right there. It is always on the brink, always on the verge. However long God extends the time. Let me use a mundane analogy here to try to uh, impress this on you. 
Now, it's as if all the defenders in a football play, let's say that game yesterday, it's as if all the Alabama players knocked all of the Florida defenders so they were unconscious. That almost happened. Okay? It is as though they blocked them all and they were all unconscious. Well, when the last defenders knocked out, okay, completely laid out, unconscious, the touchdown is already secured at that point. The touchdown is secured at that point. The only question is how long the runner will choose to take before crossing the goal line. But it's done. It's a fait accompli. Touchdown is there. But how long will the runner take? Will he stroll? You know, will that out of Alabama guy, will he pose a little bit while he's doing it? Okay, that's, that, that's a matter that, that's up in the air. But the touchdown is finished. Or think of a will that calls for the executor to, to the executor is the one who administers the will. Think of a will that calls for the executor to bestow on the heirs an inheritance at whatever time the executor chooses. He's to bestow the inheritance at whatever time the executor chooses. Well, once the testator dies, the guy who made the will, the inheritance draws near in what? In the sense that it may now come at any time. It draws near in that sense. With the testator's death, what is necessary for the exercise of the executor's discretion has occurred. From the testator's death on... The heirs live on the brink of the inheritance without ever knowing when it's going to come. This is the concept. This is New Testament theology. This is what he means when he says the end has drawn near in the event of Christ. That we live on the verge of it. They lived on the verge of it. Everybody in between has lived on the verge of it. And we live on the verge of it. I had more to say about this, but I X that out because it was getting too detailed and I have to guard myself against that. But I'll put that part will be on the notes when I put them up on the website. But here's how Douglas Moo puts it in his uh, in his commentary on the letter of James. And Douglas Moo is an internationally respected New Testament theologian scholar. Here's what he says. With the death and resurrection of Jesus and pouring out of the spirit, the last days have been inaugurated. This final age of salvation will find its climax in the return of Christ in glory. But, and here's the crucial point, the length of the age is unknown. Not even Jesus knew how long the last days would last. Mark 13, 32. What this means is that the return of Christ as the next event in the salvation historical timetable is from the time of the early church to our own day near or imminent. Every generation of Christians lives or should live with the consciousness that the parousia, the return, the coming of Christ, could occur at any time and that one needs to make decisions and choose values based on that realization. So it was it was as true in James's day as it is in ours. We need to be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Now, let me read to you another quote from a fellow named Robert Shank. He's a theologian. Wrote Elect in the Sun, Life in the Sun, and this is from his book Until. But Robert Shank says, said a professor of theology whom I know, the apostolic church believed Christ would return in their day. He did not, and they were wrong. Other generations of the church believed that Christ would come in their day, but time proved them all wrong. If we expect Christ to return in our day, time will no doubt prove us wrong. Shank continues, not at all. In every generation of the church, all who expected Christ to return in their time were right. And all who did not were wrong, terribly wrong. Christ, the apostles, and the entire New Testament enjoin upon us no other attitude than to expect Jesus to return in our time. Whether he returns in our day is God's responsibility. Whether we expect his return is our responsibility for which we must give account. Whether he returns in our generation or not, we are wrong if we fail to expect him. In every generation of the church, the Lord is at hand. This is the time frame of the New Testament, including Revelation, including the Revelation. Okay, so I want you to see that because I think it's a crucial thing. It's an important thing. And I think it's led some people into some uh, bad. Okay, and it's an important thing. But he says in light of that, okay, he says that given that life is always lived on the verge of Christ's return, given that that's true for them, that's true for us. Given that fact, he tells them to be clear thinking and self-controlled in prayers. See, we need to see life clear thinking. We need to see life in accordance with 
with uh, God's revelation. We need the self-control to bring to God prayers that are informed by that perception. In other words, we need to pray as spiritually enlightened people. This is how we are to do it. We are to pray as spiritually enlightened people. We are to see life in accordance with God's revelation. I don't care what, you know, the beard strokers and these philosophers and all this stuff, if they're not coming from the perspective of God and Christ and Scripture, okay, if they're standing over here against Scripture, against Christ, no. You see, I want to bring this spiritually enlightened perspective, as Peter says, we are to pray that way. Then he says, above all, we are to love one another or be earnest in our love. Love one another sincerely. Now, I know the bell is going to ring here soon, but you let that let that above all sink in. Spirit of God speaking to you this morning through the Apostle Peter, he says, above all. Have earnest love for one another, and we're to do so because he says love covers a multitude of sins. Well, then what, what are we talking about? Love covers a multitude of sins in the sense it makes us more forgiving of And more patient with the sins of our brothers and sisters. Doesn't it? You know it's true. Love inclines toward healing. Reconciliation. Peace. 